Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named 12 Deadly Days Full Episodes. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first episode, titled Haunted House at the End of the Street, begins on a Christmas day when every household was bustling with lively celebrations in Saturn Town. In contrast, an old man's house at the end of the street was much quieter. Wearing a Santa hat, the old man was watching a TV commercial about fir trees all by himself. Two goofy young men appeared on the screen, claiming to be ghost hunters who had just arrived in town. Their services included dealing with goblins, ghosts, and even rats. The old man cursed the frauds and turned off the TV. As soon as he left his seat, a blurry figure of a female ghost appeared behind him. Outside the door, three red-hooded figures sang a creepy song. The old man greeted them and closed the door. Walking down a dark corridor, he noticed that his bedroom wall was covered in striking bloodstains, saying the most wonderful day of the year had arrived. The scene shifted to the ghost-hunting brothers, Mac and Miles, from the TV commercial. They were worried about their overdue rent for the past three months. So far, they had performed 62 ceremonies but had never encountered a real ghost. They had been getting by with their tricks and illusions. Mac was actually an ordinary person, but Miles had genuine psychic abilities. Just as they were about to go bankrupt, they received a phone call from the old man who had encountered a ghost earlier. The brothers drove to the old man's residence. Upon arrival, Miles saw a woman's figure in the window. She emitted a chicken voice, warning the brothers to leave immediately. But being broke, the brothers were not afraid of a real ghost. The old man quickly welcomed the two men into his house. A snow globe was missing from the bookshelf, which the old man explained had been accidentally smashed. He mentioned that the house experienced ghostly activity every Christmas, but this was the first time bloodstains had appeared. As the brothers shared their knowledge about ghosts, they said they sensed that this ghost was particularly tricky and might even cost them their lives. So they demanded additional payment. Once the price was agreed upon, the brothers began their work. Miles attempted to sense the ghostly presence in the house. After a brief convulsion, he revealed a sinister smile and said there was more than one ghost. Miles sensed three ghosts, a woman who died in the past and two men who would die in the future, hinting that two men would soon die here. Miles sensed that the woman who died in the past was named Belle. Upon hearing this name, the old man became enraged and tried to kick the brothers out. But the ghosts had sealed all exits and no one could leave. Even calling the police was futile, as the ghosts had smashed all the phones. Years had passed, and it seemed that the ghost bell was determined to settle things today. Miles sensed that her energy was particularly strong. The old man stammered, claiming he didn't know Bell. Fortunately, Mac had brought a detector to communicate with ghosts. The old man suggested taking Miles to the room with the most intense haunting. As they were leaving, Miles reminded Mac to be careful. The old man led Miles to a locked room. Inside was an ancient, exquisite box. Before Miles could ask, the old man closed the door and locked him in. The box slowly opened, revealing the missing crystal ball from the bookshelf. By touching the crystal ball, Miles finally learned about Belle's past. She and the man had been lovers. The greedy old man had killed Belle with the crystal ball to steal her money. Meanwhile, downstairs, Mac was communicating with the ghost Belle. Belle tried to warn Mac to be careful, but it was too late. The old man killed Mac with the crystal ball. Minutes later, Mac's spirit appeared behind Miles. As it turned out, Mac was one of the ghosts from the future that Miles had sensed. But there were supposed to be two ghosts from the future. Could the other one be Miles? Just then, the old man charged in with a knife and cornered Miles. Just then, a goose voice came from behind. It was the old man's ghost, warning him that if he didn't stop, he would become the third ghost in the house. In the end, the old man didn't heed his own bullshit and fell heavily down the stairs. The ghost bell pushed over a bookshelf, delivering a fatal blow to the old man. This job didn't earn the two brothers a single penny, and they even lost a partner. But Miles, with his psychic abilities, could still communicate with Mac's ghost. From then on, they continued their ghost-catching business, catching ghosts when there were ghosts, and Mac could help with creating illusions when there were none. On their way back, Miles stopped by a tree shop and bought a small Christmas tree. He shook hands with the enthusiastic owner and bid him farewell. Miles sensed that the owner's days were numbered, so he advised him to close early and rest. Just as Miles drove away, something rushed out from the woods and attacked the owner. The owner tried to escape the monster's attack and flee back to his house, but he didn't have the strength. In the end, he became the monster's meal. This marks the beginning of the second episode, titled The Killer Furs. A few days later, the tree shop owner's daughter, Willow, returned to her hometown and was picked up by her long-lost uncle. 
The police attributed her father's death to a ruthless tree thief. Due to flight arrangements, Willow didn't make it to her father's funeral. Strangely, just a few days after her father's death, the number of fir trees in the woods doubled. Willow was an environmentalist, which caused her relationship with her logging father to become very tense. In her father's camper, there were still pictures of her from the past. It was evident that her father had missed her in the days she was gone. After sorting out her father's belongings, Willow returned to the fir forest. She revisited the old place and found the axe her father used to chop trees. A woman wearing a cape suddenly appeared at the end of the woods. Willow chased the woman's figure through a few trees and found herself in another midnight forest. This place was filled with the piercing screams of women. Sensing something was wrong, Willow hastily turned back to escape. After taking a few steps, she returned to her own world, where the sun was shining brightly, as if the previous scene had been just a hallucination. One deep night, Willow, who was fast asleep like a pig, was awakened by the sound of a passing pickup truck. She looked outside and saw two tree thieves. They must have been the ones who killed her father. Thinking this, Willow called the police. Before she could speak, she was shocked to see the two tree thieves were dragged away by a strange creature in the woods, and blood splattered everywhere. According to the autopsy report, the bodies of the thieves were drained of blood. Since the perpetrator was not caught, the police could only attribute their deaths to a wild animal attack once again. As Willow was a witness, the police asked her not to leave Saturn Town for the time being. With nowhere else to go, Willow sought refuge with her uncle. She began browsing her father's books and found a photo of her father with the mysterious cloaked woman she had encountered earlier. Willow speculated that this woman might be the one who killed her father. To find the truth, Willow and her uncle returned to her father's tree shop. There, they ran into a police officer guarding the crime scene. Just as the officer was about to question them, the same mysterious woman appeared in the woods again. The three rushed into the forest to pursue her. After passing through several trees with her uncle, they entered the eerie midnight forest. The trees were dense and lush, and following the screams, they found the woman beneath a massive tree, feeding at the officer's blood. Willow and her uncle ran away and hid in her father's camper. Looking out the window, they saw even more trees than before. Her uncle found a legend about the midnight forest in the camper. It was said that the forest was protected by an ancient deity, and its divine trees fed on human blood. Cutting down the divine tree would end it all. The cloaked woman was the deity of the midnight forest. It must have been Willow's logger father who accidentally cut down her tree and brought it here, causing so many disasters. Her uncle suggested cutting down the divine tree, but Willow hesitated because she's an environmentalist. She had to compromise because all the townspeople would die if doing nothing. As her uncle was about to be drained of blood by the deity, Willow picked up the axe and struck the divine tree, chopping it down until the deity turned to ashes. The crisis was averted and the tree shop returned to its original state. Her uncle suggested they throw the remaining trees into a wood chipper and close the tree shop for peace of mind. Elsewhere in the town, a young man and woman were sitting in a coffee shop chatting away their hormones. The young man complained about how he couldn't stomach human food and seemed quite annoyed with the woman sitting across from him. After venting his frustration, he stormed out, leaving her behind. Within a few steps, he was tackled by two bearded men. As it turns out, the young man was actually an immortal vampire, and they prepared to torture him, beginning the third episode, Love Bites. In a dark slaughterhouse, the vampire was restrained by the three strong men. Instead of immediately taking action, they called for Sammy, who had been cowering outside. This family turned out to be a group of vampire hunters, each skilled in their craft, dedicated to killing every vampire in the world. However, Sammy was a novice with zero accomplishments to his name. Though weak and inexperienced, he was expected to be the family's successor. To train him, his brothers encouraged Sammy to personally kill the recently captured vampire. Sammy knew he couldn't escape this time, so he reluctantly took the wooden hammer and slowly approached the vampire. Just as he raised the hammer to strike its chest, terror overcame him and he threw up. His brothers burst into laughter at the sight, and even the vampire was dumbfounded. Only their father looked on disappointedly. Later in the kitchen, their father scolded Sammy. Their grandfather would be home in a few days, and the selection for the successor would officially begin. Sammy, unable to even get his first kill, wasn't qualified to participate. Regardless, his father urged him to be brave and kill a vampire. As soon as the words left his mouth, Sammy was pushed back into the slaughterhouse. However, this time, his brothers had already killed the vampire ahead of him. Hearing the vampire's miserable screams, Sammy felt a mix of emotions and realized he couldn't accept his family's legacy.
On a Christmas Eve night, Sammy went to a cafe to clear his mind. While admiring an artist's paintings, he met a girl named Lizzie. Their relationship deepened as they spent time together. However, during their dates, Sammy noticed a strange phenomenon. Lizzie would often stare at his neck unintentionally. He didn't think much of it until one day, as they wrestled their tongues under a brightly lit Christmas tree, Sammy was horrified to discover Lizzie had no reflection. Realizing she was a vampire, he let go of her and suggested they break up. Then he fled, utterly embarrassed. Lizzie had no idea that the hanging ornament behind her had already revealed her true identity. She thought Sammy had been annoyed by her poor kissing skill. Unwilling to let it end like this, she relied on her vampire senses to track down Sammy's house. Meanwhile, at Sammy's home, his grandfather and father were troubled by the lack of women in the family and worried about the continuation of their bloodline. When they saw Lizzie, a lovely girl showing up at their door specifically for Sammy, his father's eyes lit up and he immediately invited her in. As they began to have fun together, both the grandfather and father praised her, ignoring Sammy's situation. They ordered Sammy to marry Lizzie, ensuring the family's prosperity. Having a great time, Lizzie went to the bathroom and accidentally discovered a hidden room next door. She was shocked to see torture instruments hung on the walls, fresh blood on the floor, and various hunting weapons on the table. It was obvious she was now in a vampire hunter's home. Just then, Sammy appeared behind her. Lizzie questioned if this was all a trap set by the hunters. Sammy denied it, claiming he truly loved her and was worried her identity would be exposed. He planned to help her escape immediately. However, before they could leave, the grandfather, reluctant to part with Lizzie, gave her a farewell hug. This embrace made Lizzie scream in pain as a burning crucifix pierced her chest. Everyone was dumbfounded and immediately subdued her. Just as the grandfather prepared to stake her, Sammy snatched the weapon and drove everyone away, claiming he would handle everything himself. Lizzie's screams could be heard from the slaughterhouse. Believing Sammy had finished the job, the grandfather and father prepared to enter and burn the body. But they saw Lizzie perched on the ceiling like a giant spider. In an instant, she revealed her terrifying fangs. Caught off guard, the brothers and father were brutally killed by Lizzie, and the grandfather was stabbed to death by Sammy. It was incredible. Sammy had annihilated his entire family for a woman. Afraid, Sammy called out Lizzie's name. The now-possessed Lizzie was seeing red and didn't care who he was, grabbing Sammy and pinning him to the ground. Just as she was about to bite through his neck, Sammy managed to persuade her to stop. This brought Lizzie back to her senses and the two shared a passionate kiss. Afterward, Sammy and Lizzie got married. One day while kissing in their car for too long, they forgot to drive and angered another driver, Gabe, who happened to pass by. Lizzie bared her fangs at him and Gabe couldn't help but curse at the departing couple. And so they drove on, not knowing how long they had been traveling. Gabe, unable to wake the sleeping Mike, reached down to grab a drink to quench his unbearable thirst. Unexpectedly, a blinding red light suddenly appeared before their eyes, followed by a deafening crash and beginning the fourth episode, Reindeer Games. The atmosphere became tense after the collision. Mike and Gabe hurriedly got out of the car, and upon investigating with a flashlight, they found their vehicle was completely broken down. Gabe sighed in frustration, but they were shocked to discover that they struck a massive Christmas reindeer. The reindeer was taking its last breaths, and its bright nose gradually dimmed like a light bulb, before finally being extinguished with its death. Gabe believed they had brought terrible misfortune upon themselves. Legend had it that killing a Christmas reindeer would bring bad luck. However, Mike didn't think much of it. It was just an ordinary wild animal, after all. Gabe retorted that he had never seen a wild animal with a light bulb for a nose. Regardless, they had to focus on escaping. As it turned out, Gabe and Mike were wanted jewel thieves, evading the police and two other accomplices they had crossed. To save time, they dragged the reindeer's body to the side of the road and continued driving, planning to pick up a new car at Gabe's house. Gabe's mother, who was a medium and hadn't seen her son in a long time, was overjoyed, but she had no idea Gabe was a theft and believed her son was a busy astronaut. With fleeing on his mind, Gabe hastily made small talk with her before rushing to the backyard to get the car. Just as he and Mike were about to drive away, a blonde woman appeared in front of the car with a flash of the headlights. She was an elf from the North Pole. With a snap of her fingers, she stopped the car. 
The elf told Gabe that he had just killed Santa's favorite reindeer, and so he would soon become a reindeer to replace it. Upon hearing this, Gabe removed his hat, finding two antlers growing from his head. The elf grinned and said that unless the reindeer came back to life, he would turn into one by the next morning. Gabe was dumbfounded. He felt his head start to ache and his bones breaking inside him. Meanwhile, his mother remained calm. She instructed Gabe to carry the reindeer's body into the house, and she would use her spiritual powers to revive it. However, Gabe didn't move, instead scolding her for meddling. He accused her of taking herself too seriously as a medium. These words brought tears to her eyes. She suddenly slapped a fly out of the air, then chanted a few words. Within seconds, the fly miraculously came back to life. Gabe was stunned by the scene. If only he knew his mom was so powerful, he wouldn't have turned to robbery. Gabe and Mike immediately went to the scene of the accident and dragged the reindeer's body back. During this process, Gabe had already started to transform into a grotesque and terrifying creature, neither human nor ghost. It was clear that there wasn't much time left for him. Everything was prepared, and his mother had set up an altar outside the house. However, when she said that the resurrection might take an entire night, Mike became furious. Staying there for a whole night would be like handing themselves over to the police on a silver platter. He said that he wouldn't wait any longer and wanted to leave with the stolen goods right away. Upon hearing the word stolen goods, Gabe's mother was taken aback. Seeing her confusion, Mike revealed that he and her son were not great astronauts, but rather fugitives on the run. However, she refused to believe this and insisted that Gabe was an astronaut until Gabe confessed that he was indeed a thief and he had been involved in a life of crime since he grew up, continuously making mistakes such as stealing and drug trafficking. Heartbroken, his mother cried in tears. However, at this moment, nothing was more important than restoring Gabe to normal. During the ceremony, the incantations were chanted loudly and the light on the reindeer's nose began to flicker again. Gabe gradually returned to his human form, but just then, a gun was pressed against his mother's head. It was their two accomplices who had caught up with them. After robbing the jewelry store, Mike and Gabe had taken their share as well. The accomplice viciously shot at Gabe, who managed to dodge the bullet by falling to the ground. The shot hit a candle on the altar, causing everything to collapse, and the ceremony was forcibly terminated, causing Gabe to transform even more into a reindeer. To protect his mother, he charged forward and impaled the two accomplices with his antlers. Laughter from Santa Claus echoed in the sky. His mother was relieved that her good-for-nothing son had made something of himself and told Gabe she would see him on Christmas Eve. She watched the reindeer Gabe distance itself from her, running across the vast sky, becoming an astronaut in Jesus' heaven. The scene shifts to a space center where they detected an unidentified object flying above the Saturn town. Surprisingly, it seemed to be a carbon-based life form. This cues the fifth episode, Coffee Cups. In the coffee shop, Lena and Emily were waiters, and they got along really well. They often joked together about the peculiar customers who frequented the place, each one with an inscrutable taste. Just as they were talking about the strangest customer, Nerd walked in. This person never ordered coffee at the cafe, only hot water, and babbled about the government's sinister plot to poison genetically modified coffee beans and control the poor. As the coffee shop closed for the night, Emily was joking with a male waiter nearby, while Lena went to remove the sign hanging in the window. The moment she took it down, a sinister face appeared outside the window. Caught off guard, Lena let out a scream and told the man that the cafe was already closed. However, the man remained silent, and a few seconds later, a malicious smile spread across his face. He raised the coffee cup in his hand, draining it in one gulp. Emily recognized the coffee brand through the cup. It was Pod, a brand that tasted terrible and couldn't possibly be in business in Saturn Town. At that moment, the manager nearby began to ridicule Pod Coffee, calling it the trash of the coffee world, saying that only someone with awful taste would choose it. Afterward, the staff had gone home and the manager was closing up, turning off the lights and locking the doors and windows. Suddenly, he noticed that the man from earlier was standing at the bar. The man still wore that fake smile, not paying attention to the manager's words, but instead approached him step by step, gripping his coffee cup tightly. The scene shifted to the next morning when Lena arrived at work and was astonished to see that all the advertisements in the cafe had been replaced with pod coffee ads. She immediately went to the manager for answers, only to find his expression quite bizarre. The manager, who had been mocking Pod coffee the previous day, now began to praise it. 
Everything was incredibly strange. The coffee's taste had all been forcibly changed to a different flavor. The once colorful packaging paper had been replaced with unsettling eyeball designs. Not just the manager, but even the waiters said it tasted great. In just two days, Pod Coffee had completely conquered Saturn Town. The coffee shop was packed with customers, and people on the streets were holding cups in their hands, all wearing the same fake smile and moving in an increasingly mechanized way. Initially resistant to Pod Coffee, Lena and Emily began to waver. They each poured a cup of coffee and studied it for a while. Just as they were about to try it, the strange customer, Nerd, suddenly screamed, stopping them. He shouted that someone was trying to use coffee to control the town. Hearing the yelling, the manager hurried over to expel Nerd, but Nerd unexpectedly pulled out an axe and struck the manager's chest. Coffee spurted out of the manager's chest like a bloodbath, splattering everywhere. Terrified, Lena screamed and quickly hid in the warehouse, calling the police. Upon turning around, she noticed that Emily had disappeared. Nerd was already taken away by the police. The injured manager, however, was unscathed as if nothing had ever happened. Emily acted cold and strange, as she too had become assimilated with everyone else because of the coffee. Filled with fear, Lena decided to resign from the position. Everyone who had drunk pod coffee acted very strange, with uniform fake smiles and identical movements. They repeated the same phrase in unison as if they had all become a group of controlled puppets. Lena couldn't help but suspect that there was something brainwashing in pod coffee. One day, while investigating outside, Lena happened to run into the peculiar nerd. He suggested that they secretly explore the coffee shop together after dark. Sure enough, the two discovered that the coffee machines were not filled with coffee, but rather barrels of an unknown liquid. Lena went live on a streaming platform, hoping to reveal the truth to the world. However, Nerd suddenly grabbed her and forced her onto the coffee machine, pressing her to drink the pod coffee. It turned out Nerd had already been assimilated. He told her as long as we lose our thoughts and obey the world, there will be no more wars. Lena struggled desperately. In the nick of time, she grabbed a screw and stabbed it into Nerd's neck. Coffee gushed out from the wound, and Nerd collapsed to the ground, lifeless. Instead of fleeing the scene, Lena hid inside an empty canister. She was transported by the staff to a factory where the assimilated coffee people were holding an event. They chanted eerie slogans like an army of zombies. Lena picked up a cup and imitated everyone's fake smile, blending in with the crowd of coffee people. At that moment, the mysterious man who had appeared at the coffee shop that night took the stage. He instructed the coffee people to sell more coffee, assimilate more humans, and prepare for the starship's landing on Earth. Lena finally realized that this man was an alien preparing to invade the planet. The eyeball design on the pod coffee packaging was the true form of these extraterrestrials. They revealed themselves as a liquid, luring humans to drink them and turning humans into their parasitic hosts and puppets. Understanding everything, Lena tried to escape, but was surrounded by everyone in a corner. They all held coffee cups, offering her the coffee with fake smiles. Knowing there was no way out, Lena took the coffee and drank it down. The scene shifts to the town's sheriff's home. It turns out that the coffee lady Lena was also the babysitter working for the sheriff's family. Over the phone, Lena's voice was as cold as a robot's. She quit her babysitting job and recommended pod coffee to the sheriff, who hung up the phone in confusion. Since Lena had quit, the sheriff and his wife had no choice but to hire another student, Morgan, as a babysitter on Christmas Eve. Morgan is a gifted physics student who recently applied to MIT and will find out her admission results tonight. Upon hearing that she might be accepted into MIT, the sheriff and his wife were amazed and impressed. The couple had an important party to attend that night, so they quickly gave Morgan some instructions and rushed out. Before leaving, they repeatedly emphasized not to give their child, Kevin, any candy, and this marks the beginning of the sixth episode, Singer's Slaying. As soon as the couple left, Morgan and Kevin were the only ones at home. Morgan was busy texting her boyfriend when Kevin suddenly demanded candy. Remembering the couple's instructions, Morgan firmly refused. At that moment, she received an official phone call with her MIT admission results. To prevent Kevin from interrupting her call, she handed him a piece of candy and rushed to the balcony to answer. Morgan was focused on the call, unaware that Kevin had started to unwrap and eat the candy, scattering wrappers all over the floor. Finally, she cheered loudly when she found out she was accepted into MIT. At the same time, Kevin choked on the candy and fell to the floor, unable to get help from Morgan. 
Panicked, she tried to perform CPR, but Kevin remained unresponsive. Realizing that Kevin was in danger, she dialed emergency services. However, the moment the call went through, she began to doubt whether Kevin's accident would impact her promising academic future. After struggling with her decision, Morgan gave up the chance to call for help, rationalizing that it was just an accident and that Kevin ate the candy himself. Suddenly, the doorbell rang, and she nervously peeked out to see the sheriff and his wife returning home early. She quickly placed Kevin on the couch and covered him with a blanket, pretending he was sound asleep. It turned out the couple had come back for a spare key. Luckily, they didn't notice anything unusual and assumed Kevin was asleep. After finding the key and reminding Morgan about Kevin's sleep apnea, which could be fatal, the couple left again. Morgan was on the verge of a breakdown. As soon as the couple left, she quickly used tweezers to remove the candy lodged in Kevin's throat, mumbling to herself that it was just an accident. At this moment, the knocking on the door sounded again. She pulled back the curtains only to find three ghostly children standing outside. They were dressed in red, wearing masks, and singing a creepy, mournful song. She couldn't help but feel uneasy. She quickly dragged Kevin into the bedroom. The terrifying song echoed through the house once more as the children showed no intention of leaving. They even smashed the window to break into the house. Reflected in the mirror by the door, the children stood at the foot of the staircase, staring silently at her before running up the stairs. Terrified, Morgan grabbed a fire poker and quietly went upstairs, only to find that Kevin's bedroom door had been opened. As she held her breath and entered the room, she was suddenly grabbed by a dark figure. Upon closer inspection, it was her boyfriend. It turned out he had come to find her after she hadn't replied to his messages, worried about her. Morgan didn't confess to her boyfriend about Kevin choking to death. When he heard that she had been accepted into MIT, he went downstairs to get the sheriff's wine to celebrate. As he turned around, he found the three ghostly children staring intently at him. On the other side, Morgan finally managed to get Kevin onto the bed. Suddenly, she heard the sound of a wine bottle shattering downstairs. Worried about her boyfriend, she hurried down, only to find that the living room couch had been decorated with colorful lights. Upon closer inspection, her boyfriend had been stabbed to death on the couch. Startled, she let out a scream. When she looked back, the three children were staring intently at her. Fatally wounded, she crawled away, crying and begging for mercy. She couldn't understand why she had brought this deadly disaster upon herself. It turned out that the three ghostly children were members of an evil cult. They had taken an interest in young Kevin, who had died prematurely and planned to take him away. However, Morgan had been guarding Kevin's body all along, not allowing the ghostly children to get close. This infuriated them. In the end, Morgan died in confusion and pain, paying the price for her selfishness. The three ghostly children successfully entered Kevin's room and put a mask on him. At that moment, Kevin came back to life. From then on, there was a new ghostly child following the three. Wearing a red hood, it moved slowly and mournfully sang songs along the way. Under the dim streetlight, a woman sat in a car preparing for an important meeting ahead. She didn't notice the red hood sneaking up on her. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be her drunk friend. The two laughed and played, unaware of a pair of eyes stealthily watching them from behind, indicating the seventh episode, Nuts Cracking. In order to celebrate the company's business, the boss asked his assistant, Amy, to arrange a Christmas party. The employees, however, would have preferred a larger year-end bonus instead of the party. With the mindset that it's better to enjoy together than alone, the employees handed in their phones and entered the party venue, which turned out to be just an ordinary office. This was somewhat disappointing for everyone. Amy found a small gift box on the floor. As she picked it up, warm lights instantly lit up the room, and a game countdown even appeared on the side. This brought some party atmosphere to the event. Inside the gift box was a note that said the Christmas stocking was placed next to the Big Apple, but there was no apple in the room. It seemed this was a riddle set up by the party planner. However, apart from the boss and Amy, no one else was interested in solving the riddle. They just focused on eating snacks in the corner. Seeing the party turning cold before it even started, Amy felt guilty. This was because she had found someone online to plan the party. An engineer who had a secret crush on Amy came to comfort her, saying that it wasn't her fault but the game planners. After comforting her using his words, not muscles, he even gave Amy a pen as a Christmas gift. His simple gesture made Amy feel relieved. Suddenly, she understood the meaning of the Big Apple on the note. That's because New York is also called the Big Apple. Sure enough, they found the Christmas stocking next to a cup engraved with I love New York. Inside the stocking was another note and a combination lock. 
The note contained a cryptic message about the Nutcracker and emphasized that they must work as a team for the next challenge. The engineer grabbed the combination lock and arranged the Russian name of the Nutcracker on it. The lock clicked open with a pop. Just as they were about to cheer and celebrate solving the code, a mysterious powder suddenly burst out of the container. The engineer who accidentally inhaled the powder started having seizures. Everyone was scared and fled in all directions. Fearing the spread of a toxic substance, they could only watch helplessly as the engineer foamed at the mouth and died to meet Jesus. The room's network and wiring had been cut off. All doors and windows were locked, and their phones had been confiscated before entering. Calling the police was out of the question. The seemingly puzzle party had turned into a terrifying escape room game. If they failed to escape, they might lose their lives. As everyone panicked, they found a second clue. It read that they must all join the game, or they would all undoubtedly die. The boss, wetting his pants due to fear, explained that the engineer had died because he acted alone, so they must now cooperate and play the game together to have a chance at surviving. An employee with braided hair scoffed at the boss's advice and took a timid intern to the next room, attempting to seek help using the fax machine. Suddenly, a massive nutcracker figure barged into the room. The braided man thought it was someone's prank and didn't pay much attention to it. To his surprise, the next second, the nutcracker violently pressed the intern's head onto the copier. In the end, the intern's face was burned by the scorching glass, and the braided man was knocked out by the nutcracker. He was then blindfolded and placed on a table, anxious and unable to resist. The nutcracker told him he must complete a trust fall to survive, but the poor man didn't know there was nobody behind him, only a sharp statue. Ultimately, he fell heavily onto the statue, dying full of resentment. The remaining four people received another clue. The planner asked them to play an exciting three-legged race. To stay alive, the four frightened individuals had to use the Christmas stockings prepared by the planner for the race. Amy and the boss formed one team, while the woman in fat and the girl in the red hood formed another. The stockings were filled with strong glue, binding them tightly together. As the music started, the Nutcracker approached slowly, holding a long sword. Amy and the boss realized the danger and frantically raced forward. However, the woman in fat and the girl in the red hood stayed behind, arguing due to a lack of coordination. The Nutcracker didn't hesitate, drawing the sword and skewering the two on it. The Nutcracker's killing spree grew more frenzied, leaving only Amy and the boss as the two survivors. They didn't even know who the game planner was or why they were being driven to their deaths. Amy dragged the plump boss and escaped from the elevator before arriving at a spacious parking lot. The planner's van was right in front of them. They nervously opened the back door only to find countless corpses filling the back seat. It turned out that the game had been a trap from the beginning. The killer had murdered the game planner and turned what should have been a harmonious Christmas party into a bloody killing spree. With nowhere to run, the boss and Amy could only cling to each other, awaiting their fate. Suddenly, the Nutcracker figure appeared, raising its sword and viciously stabbing the boss. It then slowly approached the terrified Amy. Just as she thought she would be pierced by the sword, the Nutcracker hesitated and removed its mask, revealing its face. It was the engineer who had been secretly in love with Amy. It turned out that the engineer was a paranoid psychopath who had had enough of his stingy boss and nagging co-workers. He had carefully planned the party, pretending to be poisoned and hiding in the shadows, controlling everything. He then seized the opportunity to kill the boss and co-workers one by one. The engineer wanted to be with Amy, but she was terrified and wanted to get away from him. Enraged, he choked her chick neck. As Amy struggled to breathe, she took out the pen the engineer had given her and forcefully stabbed it into his face. The engineer screamed and collapsed, never to rise again. Amy survived but became mentally unstable, limping out of the company and starting the eighth episode, Elves Ascending. In the park, a man dressed as Santa Claus asked Amy for a donation. However, Amy just gave him a cold glance before hurrying away. This guy was named Chris, a swindler who loved to drink, gamble, and was always broke. From time to time, he would pretend to give friendly blessings to passers-by. Eventually, his girlfriend recognized him as she was passing by. She thought Chris had turned over a new leaf, but instead discovered him scamming people here. Furious, she cursed him and broke up with him. As Chris was feeling down, a man in green suddenly appeared, claiming that Chris was the person they were looking for. 
The man put a sack over Chris's head and kidnapped him, bundling him into a car. When Chris woke up, he found himself in a prison cell. The man in green and the man in red had arranged some silly tests for him. Upon passing the tests, Chris was immediately released from his cell. The two then bowed and called him Santa. The place seemed like a utopia, with everyone dressed as elves and obeying Chris's every command, full of admiration. Chris finally understood that these lunatics had mistaken him for the real Santa Claus. They served him food and drink during the day, and at night he had three Christmas night ladies to sleep with. Life was fantastic. The smug Chris called his ex-girlfriend to brag about his hormone journey, but she didn't believe his broken nonsense and promptly hung up. Chris sent his minions to kidnap his ex-girlfriend and bring her to the place. When she arrived, Chris was surrounded by servants, with his night ladies on either side. His ex-girlfriend was shocked, but soon realized Chris had joined a cult. Chris admitted that the place was indeed filled with cult fanatics. The previous Santa leader had probably fled, and the cult members urgently needed a new leader to believe in, so they kidnapped Chris to be their new head. As they were talking, the man in green suddenly approached Chris, informing him that it was time for soul judgment. Chris didn't know what that was, so the man in green explained that it was a process where Chris would use Christmas magic to peer into everyone's hearts and decide whether they were well-behaved or naughty. Chris thought this was easy. Since he had no grudges against anyone here, he simply praised each person as being well-behaved. Then he saw one of the night ladies and, remembering their flirtatious encounter the night before, teasingly said she was naughty in bed last night. To his surprise, the atmosphere suddenly turned serious. The man in green hat pulled out a gun and shot the night lady without hormone mercy. This scene left Chris dumbfounded. He had thought the cult was just a group of fools, but they were actually a bunch of crazies. Terrified and pale, Chris could only say that everyone was well-behaved and hurriedly ended the judgment. After that, the elves began celebrating and discussing the upcoming ascension ceremony. The so-called ascension ceremony involved jumping into roaring flames through a massive chimney, being burned alive. They believed that by doing this, they could ascend straight to the North Pole. Chris's girlfriend lost her composure in fear. An elf reassured her that she wouldn't feel pain if she drank the eggnog, which was actually bleach mixed with toilet cleaner, a deadly poison. This turned out to be a suicidal cult. She quickly pulled Chris aside, discussing how they could escape. Now scared, Chris prepared to admit he was a fake Santa Claus. At that moment, they noticed a secret chamber nearby where the remains of several fake Santas were chained up. Chris realized that if he confessed, he would meet the same fate. He decided to rely on his deception skills to find a way out, but it was too late. The ceremony had already started and the man in green wouldn't let anyone leave. Flames roared atop the chimney and Chris planned to escape with his girlfriend. Another elf in the crowd had the same idea, but was shot dead just a few meters into his escape. The bloody scene stunned Chris, who dared not move. He could only stand there, watching one person after another drink the eggnog and then leap into the fire with anticipation, eventually screaming in agony. Ironically, they still believed they could reunite at the North Pole. Soon it was his girlfriend's turn to jump into the pit of fire. She looked at Chris in panic, and he couldn't bear to see her die. He intervened, saying they needed to leave one person behind to return to Saturn Town and carry on their teachings. The man in green didn't believe Chris's excuse, and immediately turned hostile, pulling out a gun and accusing Chris of being a fraud. Chris knew he had no way out, so to save his girlfriend, he drank the cup of eggnog himself. His actions regained the man in green's trust, who let his girlfriend go as per Chris's instructions. In the end, Chris jumped into the chimney, leaving his tearful girlfriend behind. The scene changed and Chris slowly opened his eyes. He wasn't dead, but had actually ascended with the other cult members to the snowy North Pole. Ironically, the so-called cult was real. The question now was how they would survive in this desolate, snowy landscape. On the other hand, the escaped girlfriend quickly called her brother for help, but he ignored her as he was in bigger trouble. After much struggle, he left a cake in a box on someone's doorstep, rang the doorbell, and fled like a thief, starting the ninth episode, Cursed Cakes. A food live streamer, Freddy, is known for his love of gourmet food, but he occasionally indulges his fans by eating some dark, unappetizing dishes. One day, Freddy receives an anonymous cake as a gift, thinking it was from a kind-hearted fan. He decides to eat the cake during his live stream. The blood-red cake is unattractive and also tastes disgusting, with long strands of hair mixed in. After taking two bites, Freddy can't stomach any more and hastily ends his live stream. That night, a disheveled woman appears by Freddy's bedside, whispering three days into his ear. 
Awoken by the eerie voice, Freddy suddenly feels a churning in his stomach and rushes to the bathroom, vomiting a large clump of hair. He realizes that the cake has caused his problems. The next morning, Freddy goes to the store listed on the cake box to confront them about his sufferings after eating the cake. However, upon opening the box, Freddy is stunned to see the cake perfectly intact, as if it had never been touched. It turns out that a waiter from the store had secretly given Freddy the cake. Freddy catches up with the waiter, and knowing he can't escape, the waiter confesses that the cake is cursed. Legend has it that many years ago, there was a cake lady in Saturn Town. She would enthusiastically bake cakes for others to enjoy, but because the cakes were not looking good, no one would try her cakes. Some would even return the cakes to her. Heartbroken, Cake Lady disappeared overnight, leaving behind the cursed cake in Saturn Town. Anyone who takes a bite will be cursed. Everything eaten will turn to ash, and on the third day, Cake Lady will come to claim their life like a grim reaper. The only way to break the curse is to pass the cake on to someone else within three days. Later, a homeless man wants to try the cake, but Freddy refuses to give it to him, not wanting to harm any innocent person. Instead, Freddy gives the cake to his wicked uncle, with whom he has always had a poor relationship. Relieved, Freddy prepares a feast, having gone hungry all day. However, as soon as the food enters his mouth, it turns to dust. Suddenly, Cake Lady emerges from the fridge, gripping Freddy's neck and coldly informing him that he has two days left. It turns out that his wicked uncle did not eat the cake. Freddy finds the discarded cake in the trash, realizing he has only two days left. In order to survive, Freddy invites his fans to his home for a food party on his live stream, hoping that if just one fan eats the cake, he will be free. The fans arrive as promised, and the party is lively, but no one is willing to touch the repulsive cake. Desperate, Freddy begs his fans to take a bite and eventually offers $100 to anyone who will eat it. A long-haired man in the crowd jumps at the chance, but just as he is about to eat the cake, Freddy's stomach churns again. In front of his shocked fans, Freddy pulls another large clump of hair from his throat. Looking at the long hair, the long-haired man loses his appetite and quickly leaves, probably rushing to get a haircut. The cake that was just chopped up was still perfectly intact on the table. Suddenly, Cake Lady appeared and eerily told him that he got only one day left. Freddy planned to give the cake to the homeless man outside the door, intending to donate him a free home in hell. The starving homeless man was overjoyed, as cake was his favorite food. Freddy could have walked away, but after a few steps, he changed his mind. He didn't want to hurt this poor man, so he took the cake back, intending to bear the curse alone. Freddy hadn't eaten or drunk for three days, and at this point, he was listless. He recorded a farewell video, waiting for Cake Lady to claim his life. Starving, Freddy tried the cake again. As soon as he took a bite, he began to convulse, and in an instant, his thoughts followed Cake Lady back to the past. It turned out that Cake Lady was beautiful in her lifetime. Every year, she would personally make a cake for her nephew, but he never ate a bite. Instead, he gave the cake away. After the cake was passed around, it unexpectedly returned to Cake Lady's hands. She was heartbroken. She stubbornly stuffed the cake into her nephew's mouth, insisting that he taste it, but the boy accidentally killed her while resisting. Back to the present, Freddy finally understood that Cake Lady just wanted someone to taste her cake. As a result, he began to devour the cake ravenously. At the same time, Cake Lady emerged slowly from the fridge. Her cake was indeed difficult to swallow. Freddy ate and vomited but eventually finished the cake completely. Cake Lady carefully inspected Freddy's mouth, fearing he hadn't swallowed it. Freddy lied and said the cake was delicious. She then left, satisfied. Having broken the curse, Freddy returned to live streaming. He even invited the homeless man from outside his door to his home to share a cake feast. Since Freddy put Cake Lady to rest in peace, he became the town's hero. The story ends here and shifts to the 10th episode, Cameras Rolling. In the town lived a young prankster who was a YouTuber. He gained fans by pranking his younger brother, such as sprinkling talcum powder on his bread or drawing a beard on his face. His brother was tormented by these pranks. Their father talked to Prankster, explaining that he shouldn't bully his younger brother, who might develop trauma. Prankster stopped for a while, but his fans threatened to unsubscribe him when they couldn't see pranks. Seeing his account losing followers, Prankster decided to go big. He bought a doll named Roy from an antique market. Legend has it that Roy was Santa's toy maker. All you had to do was write your wish on a piece of paper, and Roy would help you fulfill it while you slept. Roy looked ancient, with a worn and chipped appearance. Prankster installed a camera in Roy's hat to observe his little brother's childish antics, intending to upload the videos and embarrass him in front of their online friends. The younger brother made a Christmas wish to Roy, asking for a magnifying glass and a toy gun. 
That night, Prankster was startled awake by Roy suddenly appearing at his bedside. He checked the footage from the camera hidden in Roy's hat and saw Roy jump down from a cabinet by himself and approach his bed. It was a bizarre supernatural event. However, Prankster thought his brother was playing tricks on him. To catch his brother in the act, Prankster installed surveillance cameras throughout their home, hoping to record his brother's pranks. Over the next few days, Roy would mysteriously appear at their door. Prankster complained to his father about his brother using Roy to scare him, but their father said his brother wasn't home. Strangely, the Christmas tree was inexplicably filled with gifts for the younger brother. Their father thought Prankster was pranking his brother again, so he forced Prankster to open the gifts. To their horror, they found disgusting bugs and animal corpses inside. Enraged, their father scolded Prankster, telling him not to prank his brother anymore. Prankster was baffled, as he hadn't prepared these creepy gifts. After being chastised by his father, Prankster held a grudge, convinced that his brother was behind it all. In retaliation, he stuffed his brother's beloved Roy into the oven, watching as the doll was burned beyond recognition. The brother was terrified and screamed. This act left a lasting psychological impact on the younger brother. That night, their parents were out, leaving Prankster and his brother home alone. However, Prankster discovered that his brother, who should have been sleeping in his room, was missing. Prankster didn't care about his safety, instead turning on his computer to upload the videos of his brother making wishes to Roy. Prankster noticed that his brother's wishes to Roy had been normal at first, but perhaps fed up with Prankster's torment on the third day, the brother wished for Roy to scare Prankster with bugs. Prankster then realized that the bugs in the gift box weren't his brother's doing, but were from the puppet, Roy. He realized that the doll could really grant its owner's wishes, just like in the legend. Prankster felt a chill down his spine. He checked the camera hidden in Roy's hat and saw his brother climbing onto the roof with Roy. The brother wished for Prankster to disappear. Upon hearing the command, Roy jumped down the chimney and into the house, heading to the kitchen to grab a knife. Prankster was terrified and didn't know what to do. He finally realized that he had turned his innocent brother into a madman through relentless pranks. Prankster tried to escape but found all the doors and windows had been sealed shut. In the end, he was caught by Roy and stabbed to death, paying the price for his ignorance. That night, the brother carried a disfigured Roy to the town's theater. Outside the entrance were the four vengeful ghost dolls that had appeared in the previous episode. Wearing an expression of indifference, the brother strode into the theater. Three men in black stood eerily at the doorway, but the guests were oblivious to the dangerous feast that was about to begin, and the scene shifts to the 11th episode, Phantoms Frightening, which begins 11 days before Christmas Eve. The strict director, Nico, was rehearsing a play in the theater. After his speech, the actors looked at him with admiration. At that moment, the actress, Pepper, noticed the sack above the director's head suddenly fell down, but she managed to save the director just in time. When Pepper looked up, she saw a ghostly nun disappearing in a corner. Everyone thought she must have imagined it. The scene changes to the ghost-hunting brothers, Mac and Miles, discussing Christmas tree decorations. Mac, who had become a ghost in the first episode, was still feeling downhearted. He had thought that becoming a ghost would make him more powerful, but he couldn't do anything. Then Pepper visited, saying she had seen a real ghost at the theater. The theater in Saturn Town had witnessed a murder over a hundred years ago and had been unused ever since, until a recent anonymous donation led to its renovation for a Christmas Eve play. Fearing the ghost would ruin their performance, Pepper invited the ghost hunting brothers to help. Since Pepper was pretty, Miles, who prioritized beauty over friendship, charged her very little. Notably, as Mac was a ghost, Pepper couldn't see him. Trusting Miles completely, Pepper took him to the haunted theater. Sitting on the floor, Miles tried to sense the ghost, but the theater was strangely quiet. Mac suddenly ran out of the theater, covering his nose. He had started bleeding profusely from his nose, which was strange since he had been dead for so long. Mac sensed a terrifying force in the theater, although Miles remained skeptical and didn't believe there were any ghosts, as nothing could escape his keen eyes. Miles proceeded to flirt with the girls under the guise of exorcising ghosts, and soon bumped into the theater's director. Nico was a difficult person, but to make him let Miles stay, Pepper lied, saying Miles was the lead actor from another theater. Nico mentioned he had once performed in the tragic nude play, Faust, Miles quickly praised Nico's body, saying no one would dare perform nude without a great figure. The flattery pleased Nico, and Miles landed the leading role. Watching Miles drift further away, Mac felt a sense of loss. 
He went to the library alone to research the theater's history. The problem was that he couldn't touch anything, so he could only stand by and watch helplessly. Then, the librarian, a medium who could see ghosts, approached him. In fact, it's the same medium whose son had become Santa's reindeer in the third episode. Mac and the medium hit it off and chatted happily. She told him that the theater's ghost nun had played the Virgin Mary on stage a hundred years ago on Christmas Eve. Unexpectedly, her husband shot her through the heart in front of the crowd, and since then, Saturn Town seemed cursed, with strange events occurring every Christmas. More than a hundred years later, Pepper continued to play the Virgin Mary on stage, while Miles's clumsy acting irritated the hot-tempered director. After the rehearsal, Miles invited Pepper on a date. As soon as he left, Pepper encountered the ghost nun, who appeared behind her and said the vessel must die. Terrified, Pepper ran out of the dressing room, her arm bruised from the ghost's attack. This time, Mac had no choice but to believe the ghost story was true, but his spiritual power was fading, and he couldn't sense anything. Fortunately, he could still see his own brother. Mac tried to comfort the dejected Miles, but as they spoke, Mac suddenly disappeared. He was standing right in front of Miles, who could no longer see him. This meant that Miles's spiritual power had vanished completely. After losing Mac, Miles felt really down for a while, so Mac found the medium. She said that once the psychic ability was sealed, it would be difficult to recover. From then on, Mac and Miles would be separated forever. Even without his abilities, Miles couldn't let the ghost nun in the theater continue causing trouble. So he activated Plan B, which was to dig up the bones of the ghost nun. He planned to use her bones to disperse her soul so she couldn't harm anyone anymore. Meanwhile, Pepper went to the theater alone. She thought the ghost nun must be jealous of her role as the Virgin Mary, which was why she kept attacking her. Pepper tried to make peace with the ghost, but she didn't know that the ghost was quietly approaching her from behind. On the other hand, Miles took out some holy water and poured it on the ghost's bones, followed by chanting spells. This finally eliminated the ghost nun and freed Pepper from the ghost nun's harassment. Everything eventually returned to normal. Miles lost his psychic abilities and started living a normal life. He hurried to the theater to continue rehearsing the play with Pepper, gradually getting into character under the director's guidance. As for Mac, he spent his days in the library with the medium, unable to go to heaven or hell because he couldn't bear to leave his brother. Mac went to the theater to watch Miles' dress rehearsal, but as soon as he entered, he saw the director angrily yelling at a phone. In that instant, Mac felt a sense of unease, and his nose started bleeding again. He had to flee the theater once more. The ghost nun had been vanquished, so why did this evil force still exist? The question was to be answered in the last episode, World's Ending. Mac went to the medium again, and they found a newspaper from 100 years ago in the library. It recorded that the ghost nun had been shot by her husband on stage. Her husband kept shouting that the vessel must die. Coincidentally, the ghost had said the same thing to Pepper. Moreover, the director of the play's rehearsal back then was also Nico. If Nico were still alive, he would be 150 years old. Mac then realized that Nico was the source of the evil force hidden in the theater. He had made a pact with the devil, attempting to bring Satan back to the human world through the play as a dark ritual. The ghost nun, who played the Virgin Mary back then, was the vessel for the devil's descent. Since the ritual was interrupted when the girl was shot and killed, Nico had chosen Pepper as the new vessel 100 years later, planning to repeat the ritual. The performance was about to begin, and the townspeople gathered at the theater, including all the protagonists from previous episodes. Among them were the live streamer who ate the cursed cake, and the coffee addicts controlled by aliens. Inside the theater, three mysterious men in black were the devil's messengers. Today was a once-in-a-century day with a rare celestial event. If Nico failed again, he would likely be chopped up by the messengers. The medium took Mac backstage and told Miles everything just before he went on stage. As the three prepared to disrupt the performance, they were stopped by Nico, who pointed a gun at them. The 150-year-old Nico had been watching the brothers since they arrived in town. It turns out, to prevent them from interfering, he used witchcraft to strip Miles of his psychic powers, turning him into an ordinary person. The ghost nun had been trying to prevent the ritual from starting by harassing Pepper, but she didn't expect to be destroyed by Miles' actions. Nico trapped Miles and the medium in the dressing room, deciding to play the lead himself. The scene was about the Virgin Mary giving birth in a stable. He tied Pepper to a pillar and began chanting spells. After the chanting, Pepper let out a terrified scream, but in a chicken voice. Nico lifted her clothes to reveal that the fake belly made with a pillow had turned real. The baby inside her belly was none other than Nico's master, the devil Satan. 
The audience in the theater stood up to protest, but they were quickly subdued by Nico's evil power. Meanwhile, the weakened Mac was trying to find a way to rescue Miles and the medium, who were tied up. However, as a ghost, he couldn't touch the ropes. After multiple attempts, he had no choice but to give up. With time running out, Miles and the medium asked Mac to go to the stage to stop the ritual. They encouraged him to focus and be strong. On stage, Nico raised a dark dagger to deliver Pepper's child. Accompanied by her screams, a demonic baby squirmed in Nico's arms, pretty annoying. The puppets in the audience cheered, raising their arms, including the coffee addicts. It seemed that Satan's power was much stronger than the aliens. Mac rushed to the stage, trying to pick up the dagger that was discarded nearby. After several attempts, he finally succeeded. He raised the dagger and charged toward the baby in Nico's arms. Due to low budget, the following scene was depicted with Mac's hand-drawn illustrations. In short, Mac fought a fierce battle with the devil, eventually defeating him and his followers, restoring justice. After this ordeal, Miles' psychic powers were restored, and everyone's memories of the event disappeared, as if the battle had never happened. The ghost hunting brothers continued their business, welcoming a new client. The client told them that there was a problem with the local coffee shop in town. All the people who drank coffee there had become puppets. The devil had disappeared, but the issue of the aliens in Saturn Town remained, indicating that more TV series were supposed to be made to cover the alien hunting journey in Saturn Town. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.